Hello and welcome to another episode live of Tech Thursday here at OM System. My name is David, if you don't already know that. I am one of the technical experts for OM System based here in the UK, one of many around the world. And Tech Thursday is your monthly technological YouTube live to come and ask loads of questions about your cameras, how they work, how the features work, and hopefully get some answers out of me. But not always, <laughs> as has been proven the case many times in the past. But I will do my best for you. So today, I'm going to try not to bump into the microphone, which I have to admit, I've done three times before going on live today. So if there are any loud noises, I apologize straight away. But this is the penultimate Tech Thursday of 2023, which means we've gone through another year. It's been crazy. It's been incredible. We've had some wonderful new products this year, some fantastic things to do. Uh, and we've all chatted a lot as well, like we have done for the past sort of three years, really online. So it's been a really, really great year. Uh, we should have some more exciting things to come in December. But for now, this episode of Tech Thursday is going to be a few top tips for your OM1 and your camera in general. But I'd also, of course, like you to put your questions into the chat live. And I will do my very, very best to answer as many as possible within my allotted time slot before, some, before somebody turns me off. Well, then anyone else is going to turn me off because it's just me here, just me pressing all the buttons. So when I'm kind of doing this and reaching around, yeah, it's because there's just me uh, and I'm trying to do it all on my own. So bear with me. And we should really dive straight into it. I'm going to say a couple of hellos uh, because it's been a while since I was on, I think, probably about a month. Uh, I joined in with the Ask Me Anything with Claire and the gang. I should have been on that, but sadly, we were a little bit short on staff. So it was background for me. So I'm going to say some highs to people. There are already some questions in the chat, which is fantastic. I'm not going to give any names out. I'm just going to say where you are. We've got Florida, Kansas, Canada. Atlanta, Buckinghamshire in the UK. It's freezing in the UK, by the way, at the moment. Absolutely freezing. And everyone's saying it's really, really freezing. And then this is incredible. I have to I have to bring this one up because it's fantastic. From Bertie Ann, which is uh, face red heart shape, face red heart shape. This is the translation of, of the uh, emojis that I get through, through my particular piece of streaming software. But Bertie Ann, uh, the sentiment is lovely and I really appreciate it from Toowoomba. One of my favorite places. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'm going to dive in. I'm just going to type, uh, I'm just going to bring up Michael's question here just because I want Michael to jump back into the chat and let me know what this one means. Michael's asked very early on uh, before we went live, how do I redo if I already did on my camera? And I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. I don't know whether or not you want to redo an image or whether or not you want to reset your camera. But Michael, jump back into the chat if you're still there uh, and let me know exactly what you want from that question. Uh, and let's see if we can uh, see if anyone else has got a quick one in before I dive into my tips. Um, and hopefully the questions that you've got don't match up in mind. So we get lots more tips. Uh, okay. So, and obviously bear in mind, I have to read these and talk to you at the same time. Uh, fantastic. Here we go. A great one. Uh, Shrula. Hi, Shrula. Thanks for joining in. Uh, please, can you advise me on OM1 housing for Gannett Shoot? Um, you won't need a housing for your own one if you're doing gannet shoots. So that housing usually refers to an underwater housing. Uh, and I'm assuming that you're not going to be shooting those gannets uh, underwater. Maybe you are. Maybe you're shooting them below surface. If you are going to need a housing for your own one, if you are shooting below surface, if you're shooting the birds coming through the water, that's actually very possible. Then, uh, and that's possibly what you mean, uh, Ashrula then you probably want to look at something like, uh, oh, you know, I forget the name of it now. Somebody's going to put it in the chat for me. There are a couple of housings out there. Let me think about that one. The name uh, escapes me at the moment. Uh, we'll come back to you on that one. If somebody doesn't already jump in and say the name of the housing, let's have a quick look at down the chat, which I don't think they have. Uh, okay, well, we'll come back to you for sure. Right, we'll come back into the chat in a minute where loads of people would have put that housing in that I can't remember for the for the life of me right now. Uh, and I'm going to jump into my first tip, okay? I get a lot of emails and questions saying that the camera's not behaving properly, the back screen's not coming on, and things are just a bit funky when it comes to swapping between the viewfinder and the back screen. It could be all kinds of things going on. So my first thing to say is before you even start to set your camera up and shoot, you've got to really look at maintaining it. Maintenance is super, super important. Uh, you know, keeping it clean. Yeah, they're weather sealed. They're, you know, built with really, really strong um, uh, components and things like that. But they do still need a little bit of looking after. So 
And let's um, let's go over to an overhead camera, which will be a little bit dark at the moment. And uh, let's brighten it up a little bit. So somewhere like this. Here we go. Perfect stuff. Uh, so this is my OM1. It's plugged in at the moment, but we don't need to worry about that. We're not going to be looking at anything on the screen. Now, what you can see is that in here, my viewfinder, it's really easy to see, actually, uh, on, on the lives because we've got all the video lights and stuff. You can see in there that it is actually quite dusty. And so you can get dust and dirt and things like that inside the viewfinder. And there's a little sensor just at the back here as well. So that's there to detect when you put the camera towards your face and it'll switch from the viewfinder to the back screen nice and easy. But if there's stuff all over that, or if there's a water droplet that's dried on top of it and it's preventing the, uh, the, the, the movement sensor from working, then it can create all sorts of funky behavior. So on your own one, you've got these two little slider clips just under here on each side of the view, uh, eyepiece. And you can just pull them together and slide it off. And you can see how grubby this is. Oh, it's full of dust. That's perfectly normal. Absolutely normal. So a lot of people now taking their uh, eyepiece covers off and going, oh, that's disgraceful. It really isn't. Uh, it's perfectly normal. So you're going to get yourself a little microfiber cloth and you're just going to go in there. You can get yourself uh, a little uh, dry microfiber swab as well, and that will work. And all you're doing is just making sure that you can see those two little sensors just there. If I reflect the light a little bit. You just want to make sure that they're clean. It's better for your vision as well, obviously, if that's cleaned all the time. And you can take a little brush to the outside parts as well. Be gentle. And then we're going to take the uh, EVF cover, the eyepiece cover back. We're going to slide it over the top. We don't need to push any buttons to slide it back on. And then we're just going to slip it in there as well. Give it another little quick polish. And that's it. And just keeping that IP sensor nice and clean is going to prevent any crazy funky things happening with that back screen coming on, going off and things like that. So it's really important to think about maintenance when it comes to things like that. Now, it's not just EVF maintenance that you want to think about. It's all sorts of maintenance. So if you're regularly using the ports on the side or you're using uh, a remote cable release, you should get yourself a small camera cleaning kit, with a little brush uh, and just Take, take care of your camera, little brushes around the, all the ports and the covers. Make sure that they open and close nice and smoothly. And also when you're doing that, it's kind of a good excuse to kind of inspect the sort of workings of your camera, making sure that uh, that the hinges on doors work properly, that none of the um, the silicon covers have, have, have pulled off. It's just a good opportunity to, to get a little bit more up close and personal with your camera. Uh, good. So that's tip number one. Let's have a look if anything's coming to the chat about that housing. Because as soon as I see somebody that somebody's written it, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick myself. It'll be in there somewhere. Oh, let's see. Oh, there's a couple of people saying different names actually, ones that I've not heard of. So uh, Icolite Underwater Housing, AOI Underwater Housing, um, Nauticam, Bashwell Thirty Nine. Others may have said it. But Bashwell39 said Nauticam. Nauticam was the, the name that I was grasping into the ether for, uh, for Shrula there. Uh, so if you are going underwater, Shrula, you're going to need something like a Nauticam. But there are other suggestions in there. Well, Nauticam seems to be the most favorable, probably also the most expensive. Uh, so there you go. Right. Aside from that, <laughs> it's, it's second to Christmas, second last of the year. So I'm going to bring up the silly comments as well today. Uh, Imposter Tot has said that we Brits don't know the cold. No, but we like to moan. We might not know the cold, but we, don't, we, we live with general chilliness all year round, but we do like a good moan as well. So yeah, perhaps if you're, if you're, if you're north, no, more north than we are, then yeah, we don't know the cold. <laughs> um, but it's any excuse to have a good whinge when, you, when you're British. That's what we live for. Uh, okay, let's have a quick look here. Uh, I'm not getting a chance to read them all, so I'm going to kind of read them as they come up. Um, Alan says, greetings from London. Greetings. I have a 10 times microscope objective lens. Is it possible to attach that lens to an OM1? What kind of hardware adapter, converter, etc. do I need? There's tons. There are tons of adapters, so it depends on the objective that you've got. It depends on the fitting, but uh, all you want to do is search for that fitting, um, to OM1, which is Micro Four Thirds, um, and you can get loads and loads of different adapters for those. And loads of people are doing uh, microscope objectives with bellows and things like that for macro photography, so it's really, really cool. 
if you're in London, actually, let me pull up Annan's uh, thing again. If you're in London and you're into that kind of thing for macro photography, then uh, close to London, do stop by Chiswick Cameras. Chiswick Cameras is, uh, has got a guy called Andy Sands, and Andy Sands uh, knows a ton about that sort of stuff. So pop in and see Andy. Uh, okay, let's have a quick look. Any more? Right, let's have a quick look at uh, Stephen's question. There have been some custom settings for download recently. Is there a way of seeing what the settings are apart from loading them in the camera and trying to work out what changed? Uh, if it's settings that we've provided, we generally tend to list them or we try to list them. Um, if it's settings that other people have made, yeah, who knows? I mean, you really want to sort of tap them up for the information on what they've um, what they've done to it, really. It's difficult to say. There is no definitive piece of software that we use that will tell you what's uh, what's changed, um, but we will always try and give you those details. It's a good question. Uh, let's have a quick look. Sherby, my OM1 takes blurry pictures. Mine doesn't. I take blurry pictures. My own one's pretty good, but you know me, me, the person behind it, takes blurry pictures. Make sure that you're not in manual focus. Make sure that your auto focus is all working correctly. Make sure that your lenses are clean as well. But as always, good to see you, Sherby. Uh, right, let's go back to another of my tips. So we're going to now talk about press and hold functions. Now, these are something that come, they do come up now and again. Uh, some of you will know, some of you won't. Press and hold functions are related to button assignment. So let's say, for example, if you were to assign one of your buttons in the menu to focus stacking uh, or focus bracketing, for that matter, then that button then also will then have a press and hold function. So let's go ahead. Let me put, pop this camera on here and let's explore the reasoning behind that. We'll look at a couple of different buttons as well that can do this. Let's see. Oh, okay. There we go. Do we need to see me? No. <laughs> let's just put it on that one. Okay. So we're going to press the menu. And let's go to the menu, uh, the button assignment page, which on the OM1 is in the gear tab. So it's that sort of orangey brown gear tab. And the first option there in page one is button settings. We can press OK. And then the top option is still uh, images. Uh, the image of the camera means stills. Button function, we'll press OK on that. So then we're presented with that lovely graphic that shows us uh, all the different buttons that are available on our camera and on our power uh, pack battery holder if we have that attached as well. So let's just do my favorite, which is the old red record button, the red dot. At the moment, it's set to the high res shot, which does also have a, a press and hold function. But we're going to change this one to something that I use regularly. Uh, which will be the uh, focus stacking. Oh, I've gone past it. Let's have a look. Focus stacking uh, is that icon just there. So you've got to be careful. A couple of the icons are very, very similar. Uh, this is focus stacking. I'm going to press OK, and that's now assigned it onto that red record button. So let's go back to a live view. Now, if I press that button just once, and uh, bear with me, if I press that button... <laughs> You know, when some, you know when something's not going quite right. Let's um, let's go back into the menu and make sure that I've set that properly. I have set that properly. Okay, so this is the point where David finds that uh, something's not quite right uh, and we need to figure out why. So let's go to the... Oh! <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back. Slightly embarrassing moment when I realized that I'm trying to show you a function on focus stacking and focus stacking doesn't work when it's connected to my HDMI cable. But we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it through the overhead camera. <laughs> so I'd like to come up with some excuse like, in my defense, I've been staring at a computer screen all day editing tip videos for you guys that will be going on YouTube. But I don't think any of you would care about that. And you just want the tips properly, don't you? So <laughs> let's go into the overhead. Uh, here we go. Let's come back in here under the overhead. I'm just going to darken that down a bit so we can see the screen. There we go. Uh, okay. So let's take it off that and go to here. There we go. So now if I press the red button once, <laughs> you'll see here that focus stacking function has popped up. So the next shot would be a focus stack function. But if I press and hold that button down, 
and then turn uh, the rear dial, it instantly pulls me into the focus stacking option menu so I can make any changes to those parameters that I had done before. So effectively, it means that I don't have to keep running rings and going around into the menu. Uh, so I'm shooting normally. I press the button once to turn stacking off and on, or I press and hold it and then turn my rear dial and I can let go of them all then uh, and I can make the changes to any of the focus stacking options. <laughs> well, we got there in the end with focus stacking. I should have really done that with high res mode because that does work when connected. So let's pick, <laughs> let's pick a few. There's a few of you chuckling at me in the chat as well, which is great. Uh, let's pick a few functions that I will be able to show you through, <laughs> through the cable. So let's go back over to the camera just there. Uh, back into the menu, let's go to button function. Uh, and then let's change that to something that I know works uh, with my cable attached. And that's gonna be something like, let's say AF limiter. So the AF limiter is a really, really good option to choose for a, a, a button customization. Uh, and of course, rolling into that, the press and hold functionality. So let's lock that in. AF limiter uh, is locked into the record button. Let's go back to a shooting mode. If I now press uh, the red button once, you'll see up in the top right hand corner, AF limit is now active. It's active to whatever I've previously set it to. Now, if I haven't actually set anything to it, all I need to do is press and hold the record button and turn the rear dial. And I can go in and see what those AF limits are. So the first one is five to uh, infinity, 10 to infinity and 50 to infinity. They're the defaults. And all I gotta do is release my, uh, my press on the right one and it will uh, kick that in. Now, if I've been in the AF menu, the green one, and I've been in page three, AF limiter, and I've set these, so let's set these to some really funky numbers. So let's set this to um, 33 to 669, and then let's do two as uh, 27 to, 460. Okay, so we know we've got some really random numbers in there. If we go back to a live view now, press and hold that record button and turn the rear dial. We can skip across one and two, which is there as our funky random numbers. And it's all going to remember what's been set. But it's a nice, easy way to choose between those limitations, which is super fun. It's very, very good if you're working with, I don't know, if you're working in a wildlife environment or perhaps in a macro environment, a butterfly environment, and you need to change those focusing limit distances really quick, that's really, really handy. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So let's look <coughs> in the chat. If anybody knows me as well, this is the face of a man that is slowly getting sick. I've dodged the my children's uh, school coughs and colds for quite some time, but I think this one's caught up with me. Uh, Loads of people asking about uh, new products. Hey, when there's a new product, we will tell you about it, but not right now. Uh, let's have a quick look. Mm, okay, here, let's take this one. Let's have a John. Hey, John, good to see you in. John Dolson's asking, using OM Capture and the EM1 Mark III, should I be able to change mode, PASM, et cetera, or do I need to do that on the camera? It's a great question, and you do need to do that on the camera. So the OM Capture is a super powerful software. Uh, I generally do um, some free to attend Zooms on OM Capture. It's really, really fun. It's tethered, uh, studio-style shooting. You can do it outside if it's you know fair weather. Um, but you do need to change the mode on the camera because the way tethering software is generally designed, it is intended for kind of like portrait studio use where you, you'll be holding the camera all the time anyway. Uh, so in that uh, sense, you do need to change it. So you're not missing anything at all, John. Uh, let's have a quick look. How to reset, uh, oh, good question now. How to reset the EM13 to the factory settings. It's really easy. You're gonna press menu, and then on the left-hand side, you've got a whole lot of icons running down the bar. You wanna go to camera option number one, and then you wanna go to uh, reset. It says reset custom mode, and then you're going to reset, and then choose full reset, and press okay. And I realized I did just bang into the microphone again. <laughs> so full reset from menu, Camera one, reset custom modes options. There we go. Let's have a quick look. Uh -huh. Arlene, great question from Arlene. 
I may have done something that makes my OM1 take a picture if I touch the screen. How do I turn this off? Brilliant. Love that one. Let's get that on the overhead camera. So uh, your OM1s or all the cameras pretty much from the first OMD have a touchscreen function. That touchscreen can either be used to focus only or to focus and shoot. Okay, there are a couple of different icons that will show us that. So let's scooch over to my overhead camera. Da -da -da. There we go. Nice quick focus. Let's just make that a little bit darker again. There we go. Dark camera, but nice bright screen. So what we're looking at, uh, Arlene, is uh, this little icon up here that looks like a camera with a finger next to it pointing upwards, okay? Now, what that means is that you can tap on the screen uh, to take a shot, okay? Now, it's not going to do anything because it can't focus on anything. So if you simply tap that icon, it now has the uh, stop or no sign next to the finger. And that means that the touch screen is now turned off. And if you tap it one more time, you'll get this little green box, which is the uh, symbol for your tapping only to focus. Okay, and you can move it around with the finger and you can enlarge and decrease the size of the AF mode as well. And then tap it one more time to clear it. Now, if that, for some reason, that icon's not on there, it could be something to do with the information that's on the screen. So if you've pressed info a couple of times so that there's no info on the screen, that might've got rid of it. And then there's another way that you can do it as well. So I'll hook the camera back up to the menu and we'll show you in the menu. Uh, there's one of those things, I think, when I first started using OMDs 10 years ago, um, just uh, actually just over 10 years ago, 10 years of September. Wow, that's gone very quickly. And I would take lots and lots of images of my feet because I was touching the screen accidentally. And you kind of get used to it. Sometimes I still take pictures of my feet. Um, okay, so let's go to the menu and you're going to be in the, uh, the, the wrench menu <laughs> <clears throat> and then in page three, you've got your touch screen settings. So it's grayed out for me because of the HDMI, but you can see exactly that it's an on off option for touch screen settings on in. Uh, if you don't want to be touching the screen accidentally and shooting, then you can go into that page uh, and turn it off. And mine's off by default now because I've just connected up to that HDMI cable. Um, really good question, though. Thanks so much. Okay, let's have a quick look. Uh, okay, Justina. Hey, Justina. Good to see you. Can I confirm how to set one of the custom buttons to do back button focus and the best settings? It varies slightly depending on the camera that you've got. So if you've got an OMD, so an EM1 or an EM5 or an EM1X, uh, then you're going to be using the AEL button on the back of the camera. Um, if you've got an OM1, then you've already got back button focusing, and that's attached to the AF on button that's on there as well. So uh, just jump back into the chat, Justine, and let me know which model you've got, and we'll work on that one. Uh, <laughs> loads of people with... The two, well, it looks like AOI and Naughty Cam are the two favored underwater housings tonight, which is great. Uh, let's have a quick look. Hmm. Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hints for ease in taking movies where you can change ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. Uh, so you want to change your ISO and your shutter speed whilst shooting a movie. Um you need to be shooting your movies in manual mode. So let me show you exactly where you'll do that. And then it's just as simple as changing everything else as you do for stills. So in your menu, under your video tab, which is the fourth one along there, you've got the mode. And by default, this is set to P. So all you can do with the dials is adjust the brightness as you can uh, in, in still mode. But if you select uh, M, then you're going to be able to shoot everything. So let's just see if we can. Um, let's have a quick look. Go into movie mode in this camera. There we go. And there we go. So we are now in movie mode. It's a little bit dark. Let's brighten it up. Uh, so I do have full control of my shutter and my aperture from the two dials and my ISO from my ISO button as well. So I can make adjustments to that as well. Now, if we were to start recording, then you can see you get your red frame and you've got your recording up in the top corner. 
then I can make the adjustments to the shutter speed and the aperture uh, at, whilst we're recording again from the two dials, rear dial for shutter and front dial for aperture. And all of that simply relies on your movie mode in the menu being set to M, which is nice and easy. Um, hopefully that helps. And having gone through the last couple of years, learning more and more about shooting video uh, from a background of never wanting to touch video, I've realized that manual is the way to go. And manual focus as well, strangely. Um, thanks, Sharon. Very cool question. Okay, one more from the chat and then we'll go back to my tips over here. Let's see. Okay, Annette. Hi, Annette. Good to see you as well. I haven't seen you in quite some time. Uh, Annette, I have a problem with the Bluetooth draining the battery. OM1 RMWR1 very quickly. Is this normal or do you have any tips? You should really only have your Bluetooth active when you're using the RMWR1. Uh, if that's when it's draining, maybe it's the temperature because, Annette, I know you're in a quite a cold environment um, so that could be temperature related, but try to only use the Bluetooth when you're using the RMWR one um, and switch it off when you're not, and that should help. Right, let's look at my list here. So we did EVF sensor cleaning, really important. Press and hold functions, experiment with loads of those. So loads of your buttons have a press and hold function, tons of them. Live ND, press and hold the button, turn the dial, and you can change the ND level. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to come on to that. I'm just going to move that one. So I'm going to come on to menu options, the way that your menu recalls. Let's bring the camera up here. So this might sound a bit strange, but if we're coming from a live view, these are all default settings, by the way. Now I'm just going to go back into stills mode. On the default settings of the camera, when I press menu, it will go back to the last place that I was in the menu. Okay, so this in this case, it was the video settings. Now, that's great for me. I love that, uh, particularly when I'm teaching, because it means I'm always going back to the last place that I was at. That might not be right for you. And again, this is a very personal thing. So you can change things up how you want them to leave them alone, change them. It's entirely up to you. Remember, we're not telling you the rules. We're just giving you the options. So to do that, you're going to be able to go to your operation settings. Oh, sorry, not your operation settings. What am I saying? Um, <laughs> do you know what it has been a long day when you can't remember where you're meant to be going? Here we go. So you're going to go to your um, gear settings and your page two. And in the page two, you're going to go down to menu cursor settings. It simply means where does your menu uh, cursor remain or remember itself? Press OK. And then you have a couple of different options in here. Now, the page cursor position, that's what page you want, will be reset to the top. The menu start position is the recently used menu. So wherever you were last, it will go to that at the top of that page. And if you're in bulb mode, so you're you either using bulb, live composite, or live time, then when you press the menu key, it will always go to the bulb mode settings rather than the menu proper, OK? Now, I quite like that because when I'm in bold mode, if I'm pressing menu, it's definitely to change something in the bold mode settings. But you can change it so that if it's off, it will go to the normal menu when you press it in bold mode. Now, one of the other things you've got is the menu start position. This is a really nice one to have. So recently, it's fun for me when I'm teaching. It's great. When I'm not teaching, then I do like it to go to page one. So it always goes back to page one. So if we press this now, go to a live view, come back. Uh, and then press, <laughs> I remember <coughs> that there was something that I had to do with the menu in order for that to work. And that's turn the camera off and on again. So if you're going to do these menu changes, turn your camera off and on again after you've made the changes and then the menu will start to do what you've told it to do. So now pressing menu, it goes to camera one. If I scoot it all the way over to the wrench, go back to a live view, press menu again, it goes back to page one. So it's, it's obeying what I asked it to do in terms of those settings. Now, uh, what you also can have is the My Menu. So if you've set up a My Menu and you've got all your favorite functions in there and you want to go there immediately when you press the menu, then in the Menu Start Position options, you're going to choose My Menu. So we'll press OK to that. And then from a live view, oh, <laughs> from a live view, turn your camera off and back on again to allow that to take effect. And then 
press menu and it's going to take you directly to your my menu so it's really important to uh, choose your menu cursor settings the way that you like them. So I'm going to put this one back to recently because whilst we're talking about tips and going back in and out of the menu, recently is really useful for me. So I'm going to press recently. I'm going to turn my camera off and back on again because <laughs> I've finally woken up a little bit. Uh, and now when I press menu, it will remember where we were. Excellent stuff. Uh, I am half asleep today. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Let's see if we can uh, answer some more questions properly this time. Um, okay. Let's have a quick look. D -d 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 Bernie, I have an OM1 and an EM1 Mark II. When I take bird photos on the EM1 Mark II, they seem soft. I'm using the Pro 300 and 4150 lenses. They are sharp on the OM1. So there could be some focus adjustments necessary on your EM1 Mark II. Your EM1 Mark II might need a little service. Have a look at what's going on. Uh, we're obviously ruling out the lenses and having any filters on or off. doesn't matter because you're obviously just transferring those lenses over to the OM1 where they are sharp, which is we would expect it on both, to be honest with you. Um, so it's probably worth looking at focus adjustments for the EM1 Mark II or perhaps sending it for a service. And see if there's something going on. Uh, it's going to be a little bit deeper going on. Um, Rand, can I explain how to set up custom mode settings? Of course I can. Okay. So let's say we're going to set up a custom mode. Now, the first thing that I do when I talk about custom modes is I go in, I have a process, and I usually go by, I set my exposure settings first, so aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. Then I go into my super control panel and set all the minimal things. And then I go into the deep menu if I need to. So first things first, let's pop Rand's question down, uh, is I will set my shutter speed. So let's go for 500th of a second. Uh, oh, actually, that, let's not. Let's get the ISO because the ISO is in auto anyway. Uh, let's just undo the AF limit for a start. So I set my shutter speed and my aperture and my ISO if I'm going to set it. Or generally speaking, I'll keep that in auto. Press OK for the super control panel, and I kind of have a scooch around to see what I want to change. So let's change that to a cross AF mode. Uh, let's have plus 0 0.3 compensation because I like a little bit of pop. We will shoot in natural mode with automatic white balance. We don't need any flash settings. I'd keep my face and eye detection off because I'm shooting this bird. I'm going to switch my AF mode into CAF. Uh, I'm going to switch my drive mode into SH2, which on this uh, lens is going to be um, 50 frames per second. Now, you'll notice that there's been an exposure change there now, and that's because SH2 has now adjusted my uh, shutter speed to 640th of a second. That's the minimum that SH2 can use on a 50 frames per second compatible lens. If it's a non-50 frames compatible lens, it will be at 25 frames per second, and that minimum shutter speed will be 1 3 20th. Okay. You can go faster but not slower. Uh, so obviously that's made it a little bit darker, and then you'll also see that my auto ISO has been dropped to 12,800 because that's the maximum in SH2 as well. Now, if I was to go up to the ISO options and try and change that manually, uh, you will see... Uh, that I can't. So you can't go above 12,800 ISO in SH2. Uh, let's stop that ISO from flashing by just giving this little fella a little bit more light. And we can bring that shutter speed up a little bit more as well. There we go. Uh, rabbit in the headlights kind of thing. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. So... These are the settings that I would ask for, SH2, uh, center-weighted shooting again. It's rather bright. There we go. Um, you can change all of your other options. You would change your memory card options, whether you're shooting RAW, JPEG, or both, uh, and how all these things work. So I've gone from doing my exposure settings, going into my super control panel, choosing those settings, and now I will go into the menu, and I will make changes to anything I need in the deep menu. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to be something like AF sensitivity. So uh, we'll shoot minus one, minus two, sticky. Um, and then let's say we would have our subject detection on for birds. There we go. So now we've got, oh, it's not on birds. It's on cats and dogs. And that's definitely not a cat or a dog. 
There we go. So there we go. As our subject detection has found our bird. Lovely. Now, once you set all that up, the simple thing to do is to press menu, go into uh, shooting menu number one. The top option in page one is custom mode. You'll press OK, and then you've got your C1 to 4 options to fill. So I'll highlight C1 and press OK. I'll go down to the assign option and press OK, and then I'll click OK on set. That's locked all of those options into the C1 mode on my top dial, or if I then obviously assign it to a button as well. The other option in here is the reset or hold options. So what this relates to in save settings is if I'm in C1 on the dial and I make any changes, do I want the camera to remember those when I leave C1 or do I want it to reset them back to my default C1 settings that I'd saved originally? And that's how you set your um, custom settings brand. There you go. Cool. Okay, great question, by the way. Going to turn that light off because it's uh, slightly distracting. Oh, I'm sure that Robin won't mind. Uh, okay, where are we in the time? Fantastic, good for time, brilliant stuff. Let's have a look. Justin, you know, is there a reason why the OM1 will not switch off when you click on the off button? Is the only solution to take the battery out? Well, no, the uh, camera should turn off on the off button unless you've moved the off button, which you can do in the menu. So if you've changed the FN lever switch on the back to be an on off power switch, that very well could be the reason. Uh, why it is uh, and if you're using a third-party battery who knows uh, what's going on there uh, okay <laughs> so let's have a look great question from Anin. om1 and the 90 millimeter macro how to keep the focus while zooming in and out without jumping when making a close-up video um you won't be zooming with the 90 millimeter macro because that's a prime lens um so I'm not quite sure whether or not you mean moving the camera backwards and forwards. Um, but you should be using, if you're making a movie, close-up video, you should be using continual autofocus. With the 90 millimeter macro, really do recommend manual focus, to be honest with you. But you can use autofocus, but you won't be zooming on a 90 mil because it is a prime lens. Uh, let's have a couple, a quick look. Now then, there are some questions that I won't, I'm not skipping over. They're just ones I don't know the answers to. Things like Dave's popped this question up here. What filter is the best for solar photography? Dave, I don't know because I don't do that, but hopefully somebody will drop some into the chat for you. Uh, let's have a quick look here at this one. Bashwell, any ideas for UK rubbish weather macro photography, ice crystals, ice globes, etc.? Yes, perfect. I think it was two years ago, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago, I did a video on freezing flowers and things in really weird shaped ice cube molds. Um, so what you can do is you can get distilled water or boiled water, doesn't really matter, because it just it gives you clearer ice, but still shows you kind of like nice imperfections. And you just put things like small flowers into ice cube molds, fill those up, freeze them, and then get your macro lens on that. Use light from behind, use light from the front. They're really fun things. Staycation macro projects. Um, that's the kind of thing you can do for rubbish UK stuff. And water droplets are really good. Water refraction, so you can get things like, you know, the springs that you get inside a, a sort of click pen. You can pull them apart slightly and suspend them uh, with a, a nice uh, sort of abstract background behind them. And you can put water drops on them. They're really, really fun projects to do when you can't really go out as well. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, let's have a look. Ray, do you know what's happened to the user manual in OM Workspace? The update doesn't download it and it does not seem to be available anywhere to download. Yeah, the OA, the user manual for OM Workspace should be in the download section. Um, if you're not sure, send us a direct message and we'll send you a link to it, Ray. <clears throat> or you can, after the YouTube live finishes, you can come back in to like the forever comments rather than the live chat. And just put that question back in and then one of us, if it's not me, one of the team will be reading that and we'll add the link into your comment there as well. So we'll make sure that you can get that. Uh, plus a couple of links to like uh, get started with OM Workspace as well. Uh, let's have a couple of looks at this one. Andrew, how do you focus on a huge flock of small birds like tree swans? Well, that comes down to you can only focus on one point in a focal plane at any stage. So you can't focus on everything unless you have your aperture stopped right down. And then you're not really focusing on everything. You're focusing on one spot and you've got more depth of field. So it is tricky. 
Um, but what you want to do is use something like a large, if you want an OM1, use a medium or a large AF target zone. Um, and you can use bird detection, but it's going to show you like eight boxes. If it sees all eight birds, it's going to show you like eight of them and things like that. Uh, continual autofocus, use your um, plus one or plus two CAF sensitivity because if they're smaller birds, they're moving a little bit more erratically uh, and the CAF will refocus quicker. And then use you know a nice reasonable 25 or 50 frames per second if you're going to do a short burst. But try to use something like a frame limiter so you don't sort of burst and take 100 pictures of you know the flock moving two inches. A really good question. Right, <clears throat> let's see. Where are we for time? Excellent stuff. Let's go in and do depth of field lock. That's a really good one. I get asked uh, a question all the time is why am I not seeing... We, we love this what you see is what you get aspect of mirrorless cameras that's like kind of the key thing for most of us um in terms of visuals uh, but people ask me why am i not seeing the correct depth of field before i take the image you know when i take the image afterwards my background's sharper than when i saw in the viewfinder and that's because whenever you look through the viewfinder or the back screen of your camera the view that you see will always show you the depth of field appropriate to whatever lens you have on but wide open of the aperture. So I'm using a 2.8 lens on the 12 to 40 here. So all the views that I see, let's go over to the feed. All the views here that I see are always going to be um, as though the aperture was wide open because it is. The aperture right now is wide open at f2.8. Um, if I stop it down to f8, Hang on, let's just make some changes so that I can actually go slower. Let's come out of SH2 so we can get a bit brighter. If I go down to F8, I'm seeing exactly the same as if I was at F2.8 in terms of the background depth of field, okay? But when I take the shot at F8, we'll see the resulting image has much more depth of field to it. It's much, you can see things, it's not sharp, but the background is more in focus. Uh, and that's because the lenses are always wide open to allow as much lighting as possible. But if we need to see exactly what's going on there, then you've got a depth of field preview button, which is, uh, let's see, the bottom of the two buttons here by default. So if you see these two little buttons here and you've got this bottom one, that's the depth of field preview button. Now, you do have to press and hold it by default. So let me show you how that works. Uh, so we're at f8 okay but we're seeing f 2.8's worth of depth of field if i now press the depth of field preview button and hold it in you can see my background jumps into a little bit more focus if i stop that down to about f11 as it goes darker and then i press the depth of field button and there's more in focus and you can see this little green icon down at the bottom above my aperture uh, value showing me that i'm holding the depth of field preview open and that's a great way to see what's going on you get a slightly slower frame rate as you can see there while it's open but it's really really useful just to tap it and find out what's going on now sometimes people's hands aren't the right size to keep a hold onto that so we've got something called a depth of field lock so we're going to go over and find our depth of field lock oops gone straight past it uh in page two of our um gear menu and it's simply there. It's the aperture blade icon with the word lock next to it. And if we switch that on, you no longer have to hold that button down. You simply need to press it once. And then that depth of field lock is all the time. There you go. You can see I'm completely hands free. And that depth of field lock is always on. Now, if I make adjustments to my aperture whilst the depth of field lock is on, you'll see that live adjustment happening. So if I get that back down to f2.8, and I go between f2.8 and f6.3, you can see that background changing in its depth of field live because I've locked the depth of field uh, preview in. Now, two things happening here. Uh, it will use a slightly bit more of your battery, a little bit more. And of course, you do get the slower frame rate in your viewfinder. So that's the two things you need to consider. So it's a little bit laggy in the viewfinder or the back screen whilst it's doing that. And if you press it off, then we're back to nice lag-free viewing. But depth of field preview is super, super useful. Now, uh, why do I use it? Because I shoot macro. And when I'm shooting macro, it's really, really important to know the difference between the subject's focal point and whatever's going on further down the subject and, of course, the background. 
depth of field pretty so you can be kind of lulled into this false sense of security particularly when using like the uh, 60 mil 2.8 uh or now with the 90 uh, even at f3.5 there is no depth of field that's completely isolated out of focus beautiful bokeh um but if you're shooting at f11 then it stops it down a little bit more particularly 90 is only a little bit more but it's really important to be able to see that happening uh good excellent stuff hope that's a good tip for you let's see this is a great one also related to macro greg's got the 30 mil macro lens and then bought the 60 millimeter macro after that is there any situation where i would select the 30 instead of the 60 yes absolutely the 30 millimeter lens is perfect for textures it can get super close so we're talking one centimeter away really almost touching it you do need extra light sources when that happens but you can get so close you can create super cool textures now the 60 will focus at nine centimeters from the front of the lens um at f2.8 and one to one whereas the 30 is in f3.5 but because it's focusing a centimeter away from the subject it really doesn't matter you're getting such a narrow depth of field uh, but it's super cool for things like uh, textiles, barks, sands, things like that. You want to get real close to. Careful with the sands. But yeah, of course, there's loads of things you can do with the 60. You probably need uh, a light source. I recommend either an, the STF-8 twin head flash actually works really, really well with the 30 mil because it's, it's close and it's flat to the edge of the lens as well. Uh, let's have a quick look. Sherby, does the dial have to be on the B button to set up focus stacking? No, in fact, if the dial is on the B button, you won't be doing any focus stacking because B is for bulb. So that's for your uh, long exposures, your nighttime photography and things like that. So no, you don't want uh, to be on B to set up focus stacking. Uh, yes. So... Randy's asked, is there a way to program a button to toggle between bird and dog cat subject detection? Yes, yeah, sort of. It's quite quick anyway. So what you would do is you would refer back to our earlier tip of press and hold mechanisms. OK, so let's get the camera up. Uh, yeah, we can do this on the using the HDMI cable. So if we uh, and this is a perfect example because it's on birds at the moment, if we go to the menu. Uh, wrench, sorry, uh, gear. Page one, button settings, button function. We're going to change that red record button to subject detection, uh, which is that one down there with the cube. Oops, there you go, the cube with the four corners. Now that becomes the on and off for subject detection, Randy. So it's on at the moment for birds. Press it once and it will turn off. Press it again and it will turn back on again. Press and hold that assigned button and turn the rear dial and we suddenly have access to changing between dogs and cats and birds nice and easy let go there you go you're in dogs and cats so right, less of a button to toggle between the two but more of a press and hold and turn the dial randy and i hope that helps good stuff right what is focus stacking that's a great question david focus stacking is a process by which in the cameras uh in camera focus stacking feature the camera will take uh, uh, images at different points of focus through the depth of a subject, and then it will sandwich them all together via software to create more depth of field. So when you see a tiny little insect and only the eyes are in focus and his butt's not in focus, focus stacking will take up to 15 images on the OM-1 and wedge them all together so you get to see his eyes in focus and you get to see his butt in focus. If you're into insect butts, then focus stacking is the way to go. Hopefully that helps. Do press and holds work on the EM1 Mark II? Well, yes, they do. Press and holds work on all of the OMDs as well. Uh, Skater Jelly, the best username today. Skater Jelly, thanks for your great question. I've never got focus limited to function correctly. Sat sitting in grass testing the distances out. So <clears throat> what you want to try and do is use the built-in uh, distance calculator. I mean, it's not laser accurate, but it's pretty helpful. And you can use that through the uh, manual focus preset options, uh, Skater Jelly. So uh, if you want to do that, you can go into, uh, let's turn off subject detection. If you go into your super control panel up to your focusing mode and choose pre-MF, don't press OK on it, but press info. And that takes you into the preset MF distance. Now, this simply acts as a calculator now. It's probably not going to work on the Robin because it's super close, but it might do. So if I focus, oh, there we go. 
zero 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 point two meters away. Okay, so if I move my camera back and halfway press my shutter, zero zero point three meters away. So while she's sat in the grass testing those distances out, you can actually use this as a way to find how far away that tree is or how far away that island on that lake is. And then remember those settings and input those into your focus limiter, which is super, super cool. Uh, zero, zero, zero point one. That's not bad. Uh, cool. Hope that helps you. Ah, can you change from feet to meters in the limiter? Yeah, you can. That's an easy one. So uh, if we're in the menu, and we go to the AF options, uh, page three and AF limiter and go to the distance. You can scooch yourself all the way over to where it says meters and just press up or down. So go to from meters to feet, uh, which is nice and easy. Cool question, right, good. How much time have we got left? Oh, we can get away with a bit more. Um, Right, I'll take one more question out of the chat and then I'm going to go over to what I wanted to show you on the overhead camera. Yep, we'll do that. So let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. It's always tricky when you've got to try and read through. Um, nah, that's a good one, bit of kit info. David Rich, is there an L bracket that works with the OM1? Yeah, I believe so. Really right stuff. Have one. Uh, as far as I know, three-legged thing also have one. Uh, maybe small rig, but definitely really right stuff. They have one. And James, AEL stands for auto exposure lock. So it will lock the exposure for, um, depending on the metering you're using. It's especially useful if you're using spot metering to meter your exposure from someone's skin or from the background if you want to do silhouettes. Um, and it'll lock it there. So no matter, no matter where you move it around, the exposure settings will be locked. Auto exposure lock. Uh, right. Let's do the last tip uh, on my list that I'm going to have time to do. And that's basically through the overhead camera. So let me just uh, pull some cables out, throw that there, make some noise. Um, and look at this one here there we go well, that was a nice quick refocus lovely what i wanted to talk to you about here um is in the playback menu Ta -da! there's a picture um of a real robin if you believe me so in the playback menu you have loads of cool options you can press okay when you're in playback and you get all these cool little options down here You've got raw data edit, which we're going to explore. You've got image overlay, which is a fantastic way to do sort of multiple exposures. Share order, where you can adjust what gets shared via the app on your phone. You can do ratings on the OM1. Uh, the ratings is only OM1 at the moment. You can lock images. You can add a voice file, which is incredible. <laughs> uh, you can rotate, and of course, you can bin. Get rid of it. Let's uh, let's go to one of the fun ones. So let's, you can record a voice file. So that is a Robin. So we can highlight the um, image of the microphone in our playback menu, press OK, and we can say start, and we can go, that is a Robin. And press OK again. And now you can see that it's got a little voice note next to it as well. So go back to that one. Oops. <laughs> and I've completely forgotten how to play it back. There we go. Start. Uh, this is a Robin. And then there we go. So the voice note will play as you scroll through and back to it. I'm not sure if anyone can hear that. Let me, I'm just going to bring it up to my microphone now. There you go. Oh, don't you just love hearing yourself back? So that's a really, really fun, uh, cool feature. Let's see if I can get my camera to focus. There we go. Uh, let's go on to a different image now. Let's go to, oh, look, there's some Lego fantastic stuff. There's a Lego man. Right, let's try out the raw data edit. So press OK on any image, providing you've taken this in raw. If you've taken this in JPEG, you'll get a JPEG edit option. Um, or if you've got it in raw and JPEG, you'll get both. But we've got only raw for this one. So let's go raw data edit. Uh, now you've got current, which will be the last settings used. 
custom one, which is where you can create some new uh, raw settings, custom two, where you can create a second set, art bracket, where you can apply some filters, or no, you don't want to do it, and it'll just go back. So let's go to custom one. Uh, and then in custom one, we can choose to change the image in certain ways. So we can change it. Uh, it's going to produce a JPEG from this, by the way. So it's asking you what size JPEG do you want to start with. So let's do a super fine. Then we can choose the picture mode if we wanted to. We can put it into black and white if we want. And to update the way that it's viewing, it's telling us we need to press the red record button on top. So there we go. It's changed it into monotone for me. Uh, we can change the white balance. We can change the exposure compensation. It's a bit bright. Let's take it down two thirds of a stop and update that by pressing the record button. That's looking better already. There he is, looking petrified. Uh, we've got highlights and shadows that we can adjust. So let's adjust the highlights. Let's bring that down and let's bring the shadows up a bit and then adjust it. There we go. We can change mid-tones, aspect ratio, uh, any noise filters if you need to change your color space for your printing or web purposes. And then you can also do a bit of keystoning if you want as well. Once you're happy with that, you can press OK. And it's just asking you yes or no. The yes or no simply means do you want to keep it or not. So let's say yes, we'll keep it. We don't want to reset. We want to exit. So now we've got our original uh, raw all the way back here but it has produced me a nice black and white JPEG just there. Yeah, he looks looks pretty cool, pretty nice. Nice, easy uh, editing to JPEG. Now, a lot of you might say, well, hang on a minute. Let's be honest. Who's going to want to do that? Well, weirdly, we live in a world now where huge amounts of people are shooting JPEG only. And also, if you're traveling and you don't want to get your whole editing kit out, but you want to quickly share an image, just do a few tweaks on it, you can do the raw data edit to turn it into a JPEG. You get to keep the raw anyway. And then that JPEG can get sent over to the uh, OM Image Share app and shared wherever you like. So it's nice and simple. So that is uh, cool. Let's go back over. Uh, so that's now a JPEG. So if we were to press OK on this one, we get a JPEG edit option only, which gives us less options anyway. So if we press OK, we can do things like shadow adjustment, red eye fix, cropping, aspect, black and white, uh, sepia, saturation, reductions. So if we were to just go, look, let's crop it. We can use our dials to crop through. There we go. That's a nice little tight crop. We can say, yeah, we'll have that. And it's a simple, even simpler JPEG edit. So we've kept that JPEG and we've got a new JPEG. So there's all sorts of options that you can do. Now, I'm going to go back to him uh, because I'm going to now select the image overlay. An image overlay is a bit like multiple exposure, but it's not live. So if you've got raw files, you'll always be able to overlay them. We're going to press OK. We can do one, or, uh, two or three images merged and press OK again. So I've already got a tick in that one. That's the one that I've selected. I want to select my second one now. So I'm going to select, uh, let's select there, the head of my guitar. So you can see there that you can just about see, my Lego man's there, but you can just about see the guitar overlaid on top of it. Now I do have options to make those uh, more or less translucent like this, all the way back. I can barely see it, or I can make him less translucent and the camera, uh, sorry, and the guitar uh, more visible, okay? And then all you gotta do is press okay and say, yeah, is that what I want? Yeah, cool, so we'll have that, press yes. Now, interestingly, that's still a raw. So that means that this overlaid image, this multiple exposure can, then be done again. We go all the way down to image overlay. We can do two images merge. We can use the merged one that we already made and merge it with more. So let's merge it with that. These are gonna be different aspect ratios. This is gonna be look a little bit messy. Uh, let's bring the original one up a bit and the camera down a bit, press okay. Yeah, it's a bit crazy, it's a bit all over the place, but this is just to prove that we can do multiples. And again, this one is now also a raw. So you can just keep going on and on and on. We're not going to though, because it's just going to look terrible. Okay, let's check out this uh, ATST. Press OK. And you go down to your rating option, press OK again, and you've got your stars. You can rate this one up to five stars, or you can rate it at one star. This is definitely getting a five star rating not because of the quality of the picture, just because of the content. Uh, and then we can also go down to the lock 
We can lock things by pressing the AL button anyway, but you could also do it from here. And we can rotate them as well. So we've got tons and tons of options within our playback menu. And you should really explore those and see how they fit in. It's really, really good. Actually, if you're traveling, you know, particularly if you don't want to take things with you and you just want to do things on the fly, that is a great way to do those. Uh, okay, let's see. Tons and tons of questions that I am not going to get through. I'm so sorry. But I encourage you all to come back to the video, you know, 10 minutes after we finish and re-add your questions as comments because that way we can, they'll be there forever then and we can kind of like deal with them uh, as and when. Um, okay, can you do, oh, I'm just going to, oh, definitely just going to do this one before we log off um, because I have run out of time. And that's Rachel who's asking, can you delete multiple images at once? Yeah, you can. So let me go back over to my overhead camera. And if we want to delete multiple images at once, so we go into the playback option and then we use the rear dial to uh, cycle clockwise and bring it back to a thumbnail view. And then you press and hold the red button once you've highlighted the first image that you want to delete. So I'll highlight that one. You can then press and hold that red button, keep it pressed down, and then cycle through with the rear dial. And you can see a little tick appearing in all those boxes. And then once they're all ticked, you can either just press the trash can or you can press OK for a multiply selected option. So you can share, rate, lock, or erase all of them at once. Nice and easy. Press and hold to record and turn the dial at the same time. Brilliant final question, Rachel. Fantastic stuff. So um, we will, we, I will be back for the final Tech Thursday, which has the potential to not be a Thursday. We don't know yet. So December is going to be really, really busy. There will be one more Tech Live before the end of the year. And hopefully uh, you'll come and see me then. If not, have a fantastic final month. Uh, however you celebrate, uh, do or don't, um, eat, drink, and be merry, and all that business. But if you have any needs for questions when we're not doing Tech Thursdays, you can always reach out to us across our many uh, social media. Send us a message. Uh, send us support tickets through Explore, uh, my own system, things like that. You can always reach out. There are tons of us to help. If you don't ask, we can't help. So don't suffer in silence. Um, we do our best to make sure that everything is good for you. Right, that's it for tonight for me. Uh, be safe, be well, and I will see you on another Tech Something soon. Bye for now.